to the okay recording in progress there we go uh, let's uh let's turn to the book of jonah chapter three and uh verses one to ten jonah three one to ten then the word of the lord came to jonah a second time Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, Forty more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God might yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from the evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. That's God's word. And uh, I'll invite uh, Shai to come and bring us the message. Thank you, Shai. All right. Okay. Let me, let me pray first. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, I pray, Lord, that People here will hear what's in your heart, Lord, and into their own hearts, not what I say, but what you have written, what you have placed in their hearts, and what the Holy Spirit has led to them, Lord. That they will be inspired by the word, that they will be challenged by the word, that they will see the need, seek you above all things, and trust only you. Father, Lord, we thank you for your message. Amen. All right, um, Jonah. Jonah has a very special place in my heart, I think, because the very first year of Bible college, um, I studied Hebrew, I did two semesters of Hebrew. And in my second semester of Hebrew, one of the things we had to do as a class was to translate the entire book of Jonah. And this was in the exam, the final exam. So it's been um, scarred into my brain and my heart as well. So having chunks of Hebrew and it's like, here's your exam, translate this into English with correct grammar and passing and all the, all the nice stuff. So when Rob said, we're doing journal, um, I was quite excited uh, for the opportunity to share God's word with, about journal from journal with you. And here's a recap of the story so far. So we'll go to the next slide. Uh, next one. And next one. Right. Here's the story so far. God calls Jonah, a prophet, to Nineveh, the great city. And this has been used a lot, this whole descriptor for Nineveh, the great city of Nineveh. To this um, great city, this for those who have forgotten who the Ninevites were, who those who were living in Nineveh, Nineveh was the capital of Assyria, the Assyrian Empire. And years from this point right now in Jonah, the Assyrians, led by their king, King Sennacherib, which is a different king, will act as an instrument of God and reign destruction to punish northern Israel for their sin and idolatry. So, Israel, so Nineveh, Assyria, they were a rather violent and very um, anti-Israel country. And if you haven't figured it out by this point, they were not a nice people. And Jonah didn't want anything to do with these people. They didn't have a very good reputation. And Jonah was not particularly happy when God said, go to Nineveh and preach for them to repent. In fact, when God told, Nineveh, told Jonah to go to Nineveh, 
Jonah literally went the opposite direction. Nineveh was to the east and Tarshish was to the west. So rather than go all the way to Nineveh, Jonah went on a boat in Joppa and went the complete opposite direction to Tarshish. And God sent his judgment through a storm and the sailors on the boat were so uh, in fear of what's about to happen, they were throwing things off the boat and Jonah finally comes up and says, look, I'm the one that God wants, you should throw me off the boat. And after some encouragement, they finally throw Jonah off the boat. And rather than let Jonah die, God sends a great fish to swallow Jonah for three days. And Jonah in chapter two says this beautiful prayer, seemingly repentant and submitting to God's authority in an almost passive aggressive way, sort of a fine, have it your way sort of encounter. And at the final line of chapter two, the fish spits Jonah back out onto dry land. And here we have in chapter three. In chapter three, and God caused Jonah a second time to arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and call out against it and preach the message I have given you. So that's where we are. So Jonah begrudgingly walks into the city of Nineveh, the great city, a city so large that it will take three days to walk from one end to the other. How big is this city? Well, in chapter four, it actually says, there are probably more than 120,000 people in this city. But Jonah, rather than walking to the center of the city, three days, so center will probably take a day and a half, it only walks for one day. And he says, that's far enough. That's far enough for me. And some commentaries would say that he deliberately did this. He deliberately chose a place where it would be so remote, so rural, that it will have the least impact about the message he's about to preach. So let's go to the next slide and the next one. Now you've heard the saying, location, location, location. Well, location is important. Where you preach, what you do, where you decide is going to be where your most impact will be, your epicenter. That's all important. But Jonah decided to ignore all of that. He didn't buy into it. And he got ready and he gave perhaps the world's shortest sermon ever. This was his sermon. Od avanim yom veninever neche pachet. Yet 40 days Nineveh will perish. Five words. Jonah gave a five worded sermon. Five not so enthusiastic words in a location where there was of little impact. But to Jonah, his job was done. That's why I've given him a stick up. I did the absolute bare minimum. Jonah did the absolute bare minimum. In fact, some would say he did the absolute bare minimum to the point of sabotage that he so didn't want this to happen that he did everything he could. Imagine your parents asking you to clean your room. It's like, clean your room. And all you do is go, okay, I'm gonna put this toy in this box. I've cleaned my room. I've done the bare, bare minimum. And that's what it felt like that Jonah has done. That he, in chapter four, so here in chapter three, he went and found the least populated area, said the least enthusiastic sermon and he wiped his hands and he went off to a hill to wait for the impending fireworks that's going to happen because he knew Nineveh was going to get destroyed because he knew he didn't do much and that's what he thought but the biggest twist in this story the biggest twist in the story of Jonah at this moment is what happens next in the very next sentence after Jonah gives his sermon so if we go to the next slide the very next sentence starts with this. The Ninevites believed God. Think about it. The Ninevites believed God, despite the less than stellar performance from Jonah, despite the lack of any substance or theology in his doom saying, his doom proclaiming, despite the geographical challenges, despite all of this, the Ninevites believed God. 
And it says, from the greatest to the least, they put on sackcloth. They put on ashes and dust as a form of repentance and great sorrow and grief. They did all of that from Jonah's five-worded sermon. And they had so much impact that this sermon, this proclamation, that it reached all the way to the king, the king of Nineveh. And a royal decree went out that the entire city to call urgently to God. Now, I think the English doesn't do it justice. Urgently to God in English, it means you know, have some sort of you know, time restriction to it, some sort of an emergency. But the Hebrew actually uses the word to call mightily. To God, to call with all your might and strength, with everything you have, call to God and repent and turn from your evil and violent ways. And yet, who knows in Jonah 3.9? Who knows? Maybe, maybe God will relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. And it's Take a break here from the story and look at the context and the theology here. We need to understand that the Ninevites were not a good people. They noticed, they knew they'd messed up. They knew they were a violent and evil people. They knew they've committed violence, they committed sin, they've angered God. And what they were doing is not saying through their actions of repentance and sackcloth and ash, not saying, God, through my actions, my fasting, my sackcloth, these ashes and dust, I will now be saved because of what I've done. No, no, no. Rather, what the Ninevites are doing, they are confessing that they have sinned and that they are not worthy, that these actions were not a way to buy salvation, but rather an expression, a reflection of their repentance, of their surrender to the sovereignty and the righteousness of God. They knew they were well deserving of what is coming. And that's why it says perhaps, perhaps who knows, maybe God will relent. Maybe God will turn away his righteous anger from us. Maybe. Not because we can buy it, but rather we appeal to God's nature, his compassion, his grace, his mercy. And God did just that. God, who is slow to anger, who is quick to forgive, who by nature is compassionate and loving and full of grace, as we see in Psalms, next slide. Psalm 103, verse 8. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. And because of this, because of their repentance, because of their faith, verse 10, it says, when God saw what they did, and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented. He relented, he turned. He did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. Think about what's happened so far. Think about this story thus far. Because of one prophet, one prophet, one messenger of God, who did not want to be, who tried to run away, after being brought back on track, did the absolute bare minimum and preached the shortest and least enthusiastic sermon ever. Yet somehow through this, God managed to use Jonah to save and change an entire city, saving more than 120,000 people's lives. So think about it. Think about what sort of person Jonah is. But also think about how great God is. Now put that in context, and I would like to ask you guys a question. If I were to ask you to describe the book of Jonah and the story so far, how would you do it? How would you describe Jonah, the story of Jonah? Is it simply a story about not running away from God? Is it a story about sackcloth, ash, fasting, 
wow, it's interesting. The animals didn't eat either. What's happened there? Animal cruelty. What goes, what's flashing? What are the words flashing in your mind at the moment? This was the same question my Old Testament lecturer asked me in my very first year of Bible college. And what I believe, what I, I believe what I said then is still what I believe today. That Jonah is a story of the scandal of grace. It's a scandal. It doesn't make sense. It's illogical. It's not fair. It goes beyond anything we understand as logically logical. It doesn't make sense. It's everything about Jonah's ministry to Nineveh works does not work in a worldly logic context. It does not make sense. I mean, think about it. Worst location, worst speech, zero passion, and probably the worst person to choose. Yet, somehow, through all of this, it reveals that so clearly the amazing love that God has for messed up people. People like us. And it's extremely relevant for us as Christians today because it not only gives us a lesson on theology, but also on how we should view and align our hearts towards evangelism and mission. I know mission month was last month, but I think it still applies here. I mean, if we were to take out the three most important points that will be this. Can we go to the next slide? The first point is, it is God who saves, not us. Second point, it is not a solo mission. And the final point is, faith is regenerative. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean? God saves, not us. Well, let's go to the next slide. When I say God saves, not us, what I really should be saying is God saves despite us. It's not us that is the author of salvation. It's not us who are actually instrument in someone receiving Christ. Rather, it is God who allows all these things to happen. And sometimes God works despite our best efforts, intentional or not, to hinder it. And we can see in the book of Jonah, we can see that Jonah, has never been the hero of this story. In fact, throughout the, every line in this chapter, in this book, Jonah has been painted as the anti-hero, the person you don't want to be. He's often called the, the, the only prophet in the entire Old Testament who failed at prophecy. He failed. Jonah, who did not want to be there, let alone save these people. In fact, despite all of this, despite his almost intentional sabotage of the Ninevites so that they may perish. God somehow, through his mercy and grace, saves them. That our salvation is not determined by how well your pastor preaches, how good a sermon is, how great or large your church community is, how much fellowship you have, how much your church donates to charity. None of that really matters when you consider who it is that actually saves. All these things are good. It's great that you have a great pastor. It's great that you hear awesome sermons. It's great that your church does all these things. All these things are great, but it should not detract from the reality that it is only God who saves, that it is Jesus Christ who saves. Jesus, John 14, verse 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one, absolutely no one, comes to the Father except through me. And if we go Old Testament, Deuteronomy says, it is God who will circumcise your heart. Ezekiel, it is God who will take out your heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh. It has always been about God. And that's our theology. And because of this theology, it flows perfectly well to the next point. We go to the next slide. And the next point says, it is not a solo mission. You're not here by yourself. You're not here to do evangelism, to do mission work, to fulfill the Great Commission by yourself. Since we know that God is the one who ultimately offers salvation, who saves, 
that the success of your evangelism is not dependent on how eloquent you are, how good a public speaker you are, how much you know about your Bible, your ability to memorize Bible verses and maybe even in the original language. It doesn't matter. None of these things matter in the grand scheme of things because it's not you. It's not about you. It's about God. Sure, if you have these skills, it helps, but it does not guarantee success. Rather, what we should do is to acknowledge that rather than the fact that we are on mission for God, but we are also on mission with God. And this is why Jesus says, I will send for you a helper and an advocate. It is the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit which has the fellowship with us that helps us, that encourages us, that we need not fear. So if that's the case, then what's stopping us from reaching out to the people who have not heard the gospel? Is it fear that we might mess up, that we might misrepresent Christ, that we just don't know what the right thing to say is? Well, let me ask you this. Surely you can do better than five words, right? Surely you can do better than four, yet 40 days and your city will perish. Surely you can give a better summary of the gospel than just those five words. And yet those five words saved and tied city. Now I have this image here. I have to explain this image. This is an image of a worker and his helper. Okay. Um, now you might look at this image and think it's a really cute image. The kid's really cute and you think, yeah, this is great that we have a helper that's helping us and that this child represents the helper, but it's actually the other way around. If we were to use this image to describe evangelism and the mission, that child would be us. We're here thinking we are helping. We're contributing. But realistically, the father here can do everything. It is not up to us at all. We're not really doing too much. But rather, it is the father who's giving us and allowing us the privilege to accompany him to complete his mission, accompany him to complete his salvation of the nations. So then if we know that it is God who's in control and God who could do everything by himself, then what do we have to fear but to just be brave and just speak out for the kingdom? And the final one is faith is regenerative. Faith is regenerative. Faith does something to you. Faith changes you. It moves us from the inside out. It convicts us. It calls out to us that there is something not right in our lives. For the Ninevites, their faith caused them to repent and surrender to God, changing from their wicked ways and moving so that God, I'm sorry, moving God so that he relented from just punishment that they deserve and so too will our faith it should change us it should make us different as it says it makes us a new creation it is not enough that we simply come to church but through it become better people now in the past i have preached a sermon and particularly about a certain church that has a red bus that says on the side come as you are all are welcome i totally love it but i think that's only half the story come as you are but leave different leave better leave anew this regenerative process should stir us to be a people who not only profess the gospel with our mouths but also with our lives that through our actions, we can be a living sermon. If we go to the next slide, I have a quote from Charles Spurgeon, the famous preacher. So can we go to the next slide, Claire? So Charles Spurgeon, also known as the Prince of Preachers, he preached this sermon in 1895. It is well to preach as I do with my lips, but you can all preach with your feet 
and by your lives. And that is the most effective preaching. The preaching of the holy lives is living preaching. The most effective ministry from a pulpit is that which is supported by godliness from the pew. God help you. Spurgeon, prince of preachers, the greatest preacher, really, in history. Yet even he says, despite what I do is nothing compared to what you can do. You can do with your changed lives, changed holy lives, to be living proof, living out the gospel in the church. And that's why oftentimes it's said there are five gospels in the world. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the fifth gospel is you. And the reality is most people will never read the first four of our gospel. But every time they look at you, they will see that fifth gospel every single day. So church. Do not think that you cannot offer anything to God's mission, but rather be encouraged that you can do so much more for the kingdom than you think. Knowing with your heart and mind that God or the God of the universe has sent you a royal priesthood to fulfill his great commission, to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit, and knowing full well that Christ is with you, to the very end of the age. You are not alone. And trust me, you can do a lot more than five words. Amen? Let me pray. Father Lord, we thank you that you are a God who is always with us, who has a great plan for salvation for all of us, and that we are so privileged to just tag along we are so privileged that you have given us every resource that we may be an instrument of your love. Be it through words or actions, let us live with a desire and a hope in our hearts that we can do so much more for the kingdom than we think. Let us be encouraged to go out and reach those people who we haven't spoken to yet. Let's go out and not with fear or anxiety, not knowing what to say, but know that it is ultimately you who is in control. It's you who are the author of salvation. And that we have been so loved to be saved by you and that we are able to offer and share your salvation with others. Encourage us, challenge us and convict us to do more for you every day. Jesus name I pray. Amen.